25, verses 17 through 25. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I have created. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The reading from the New Testament is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 13. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition that they receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you, and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because we do not have that right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. Here ends the reading. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be aligned with you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A group of people asked me recently, why did you come here? <laughs> I stopped in my tracks thinking, where do I even begin? <laughs> I proposed we set aside a time where I could answer their questions and ask them the same ones. What is your vision for this church, for yourself, for our culture, for the world? How do you hope to transform yourself, your relationships, your family, your community? I am here because I think our visions line up. We have a vision for a relevant Christianity, one that seeks to embrace people, not exclude people, one that strives to live out the gospel in creative ways, with openness, intellectual integrity, and love. A version of Christianity that appreciates the arts, and music, and seeks transformative experiences. I really believe that we have a tremendous opportunity in a church, in an intentional community setting, to feel together the depths of the pain of the world, and to envision together with these ancient texts and traditions that we have 
the ways we want to bring about healing and transformation to the world. In a community like ours, we can help one another by holding each other's dreams, by holding one another's pain. When you are feeling your pain and grief and depression so deeply, if you have articulated to me something that comes from the voice of the genuine within you, a vision you have of the highest good, I can hold that up for you and remind you. We can do that for each other. Our text from Isaiah today does just this. God comforts God's people by articulating a vision of a new heaven and a new earth. Did you hear the utopic vision where no child dies prematurely, where every person lives to 100? The people of Israel needed this vision, this reminder of hope, this idealized version of God's love. Maybe we don't all want to live to 100. I saw some looks exchanged there. <laughs> we locate the Israelites in this context two generations after they have returned from exile. They are trying to rebuild their city of Jerusalem. Katie Huey writes, the evening news from Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, or Haiti provides vivid images to help our imaginations. Much of the city of Jerusalem was in ruin. As Isaiah experiences the rubble and the ruins of a once great city, Isaiah hears God's voice. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. Do you hear the pain in this passage? That they once planted and another ate. That they once built and another inhabited. And all of the city will be in harmony, God promises. Isaiah goes on, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The Israelites needed this vision of utopia. As they looked upon their devastated city, after having been there for two or three generations now, they still lived among this destruction. So a vision of a new heaven and a new earth spoke of what God would do with this very land, this very city, not a city and a land to come. These people looked at their pain and sadness in the face and found within them a vision of hope. They did not run the risk of becoming what Cornell West calls Saturday people. Those who resist the challenge to dwell in sadness, to explore it in its full measure without seeking immediate redemption, while also not giving up a hopefulness that remains stubbornly faithful for no good reason in the midst of despair. Slaves in the American South spoke of the North in code, in call and response songs. The promised land is what they called their vision of utopia, a place where they and their children could experience freedom the plantation owners thought the slaves were happy, singing Christian language of the kingdom of God, a place that rests in life after death after they work really hard. Meanwhile, their kingdom of God was a real place of freedom that they could reach in this lifetime. In song, they were giving each other coded information about how to get there, and reminders that this hope exists. Their vision of utopia literally kept them alive. Reverend Mary Nelson Abbott, 
Our newly announced South Central Regional Minister of Connecticut holds up this idea of the kingdom of God, an image that resonates with deep significance. We can be guided by the words of the Lord's Prayer, she reminds us. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. So each time we speak those words, we ask God to help us live as God would have intended, with justice, kindness, and humility, according to Micah, loving God and one another, according to Matthew. She prays, help us become the kingdom here on earth. But how do we actually bring this vision of utopia this hope for love and justice, the kingdom of heaven, here on earth. We are taught that we've got to work really hard to make the kingdom of heaven come to earth. Our other text today even warns us against idleness. But I wonder, does resisting idleness and working so hard actually inhibit us from realizing God's kingdom on earth? Have you heard of the concept of the Protestant work ethic? No. German social theorist Max Weber wrote an essay called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. This ethic emphasizes hard work and diligence, saying that Protestants, especially Calvinists, believed they ought to work hard in response to God's grace that salvation was predestined and could not be earned, but one's way of life was a sure indication if you were one of the elect or not. Elect meaning one of God's chosen to go to heaven and experience salvation. In my studies of historical New England, I came across a letter from a 12-year-old boy, Samuel Mather, circa 1638, expressing anxiety about the state of his soul and whether he is one of the elect. He writes to his father, Though I am thus well in my body, yet I question whether my soul doth prosper as my body doth. For I perceive yet to this very day <coughs> little growth in grace, and this makes me question whether grace be in my heart or no. I feel also daily great unwillingness to do good duties. <laughs> God gives me no answers to my prayers and does not grant my continual request for spiritual blessing, blessings of the softening of my hard heart. And in all this, I could yet take some comfort, he writes, but it makes me wonder what God's secret decree concerning me may be. For I doubt whether ever God is wont to deny grace and mercy to his chosen when they seek unto him by prayer for it. And therefore, seeing he doth thus deny it to me, I think that the reason of it is most like to be because I belong not to the election of grace. Do you hear the fear and anxiety in sweet young Samuel's letter? Is he one of the elect? He doesn't want to do good works, so he must not be. And God doesn't answer his prayers. So we live in Protestant New England, and we have inherited this anxiety, even if it is not fully conscious, as it is in young Samuel Mather. We sometimes drive ourselves into the ground with how hard we think we need to work, even how hard we think we need to work to do good work. And of course, working is often for our own livelihood, but we have also inherited this sense that our ability to work hard <coughs> and stay busy makes us worthwhile and lovable and savable by God. Our text from 2 Thessalonians speaks against idleness. We can almost hear the echoes of what has turned into the Protestant work ethic. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
to keep away from believers who are living in idleness, not according to the tradition that they receive from us. And then, anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies not doing any work. But to early Christ followers, work and prosperity were not signs of individual grace, but were ways to support the whole community. So refusing to work was to take advantage of others. But the warnings against idleness were so strong and are, I think, in our own culture, I wonder if there are ways that inviting a version of idleness into our lives may actually prove beneficial. The word idle in Greek, ataktos, means in disorderly manner or irregularity, insubordinate to God's work and unproductive or fruitless, becoming or lacking proper order. Writer Anne Lamott teaches writing classes where she encourages her students to order their time so that they have moments of idleness where they are doing nothing but dreaming and existing. Needless to say, this was very distressing for her writing students. They started to explain that they had two kids at home, or five, or a stable of horses, or a hive of bees, or a 40 hour plus work week, or on the other hand, sometimes they are climbing the walls with boredom, own nearly nothing, and are looking for work full time which is why they can't make time now to pursue their heart's desires. They often add that as soon as they retire, or their last child moves out, or they move to the country, or to the city, or sell the horses, they will make time. They are absolutely sincere, she writes, but they are delusional, she says. <laughs> so she prescribes idleness. You need a half an hour a day of quiet time for yourself. Unless you're incredibly busy and stressed, in which case you need an hour. <laughs> I promise you, it's there. Fight tooth and nail to find time, to make it. It is our true wealth. This moment, this day, this hour. In this quiet time, this daydreaming and idleness, this is when writing can happen for her students, when visioning can happen. If we literally open up time, we will open up space inside of us for God's spirit to flow in. In these spaces, we can locate that voice of the genuine within us that points us toward a communal vision of goodness. Utopia is different than optimism and happiness. Often ideals of happiness rest on a preordained value, a cultural expectation, maybe the American dream which becomes impossible to fulfill and often articulates a desire to be something you're not and fit a mold that will never fit. Optimism sometimes becomes an effort to deny the bad, to see goodness and beauty where there is depression and hate. Utopia rests on this notion of hope, the recognition of deep sadness, the validity of experiencing and, ex and feeling depression, recognizing injustice, and still crafting a vision for something alternative. It rests in a deep acceptance of who you are in this moment, a deep trust that the voice inside that arises from that place of silence. Utopia answers a resounding communal desire to create new heavens and a new earth not to replace the world we live in now, but on top of it, in the midst of it. 
on the day of our installation, where I officially become the settled pastor of this church, where we renew our covenant with the Middlesex Association of the United Church of Christ, we get to say yes to each other again, and yes to this covenantal relationship with our communities. The theme of our installation is new wine and old wineskins, and it speaks to this new spirit with ancient roots that we are cultivating here. A vision for authentic spiritual community of church in the 21st century. And we don't have to know exactly what is to come, or to have a concise plan for exactly where we are going, but we are asked to be in covenant with this divine spirit, to trust in the mystery that works through us, that moves in us, and flows through this space, in this good quality, vintage church. God is making openings and is creating with us and within us new spaces to experience the divine and the sacred, the goodness and beauty and justice of kindness that a vision of utopia, the kingdom of God, the realm of the sacred, necessity. So let us trust this mystery together that is leading us and make space for it in our committees, in our budget, in our sanctuary. Let us trust the spirit of the new wine that is flowing into this place. Our Lord's Prayer echoes this sentiment, on earth as it is in heaven, that our task on earth is to create the kingdom of heaven, to live in a way that brings the sacred so close that we feel God in our very breath and live as if that breath matters. And breathing, just breathing, taking time to feel our breath in what might feel like idleness helps us create new openings for this ancient spirit of wisdom that can flood our being and our community. Amen.